Hello and welcome to the final part of the ninth lecture on this course on chemical process design. This part of lecture nine will examine what to do with the material that is released by a relief event. I'll start by introducing a flowchart that can guide the decision making process and we'll see that there are essentially four courses of action to take. Dispersal, containment, treatment and flaring. The last three of these options requires a safe means of transporting material away from the vessel that is undergoing relief, which motivates the study and introduction of relief headers. Relief headers are piping systems that are suitably sized such that they can never inadvertently limit the required flow rate of relief material. We'll introduce a method that can be used to size a vapor phase relief header, and we'll see that, again, knowledge of compressible flow is absolutely essential such that choking is avoided. Now, it's important to state once more that the design of relief systems is a complex and at times nuanced exercise that involves considerable engineering judgment and experience combined with good engineering design. The design of relief systems should always be done in consultations with an established expert and the material in this lecture is intended only to serve as an introduction to the subject. Now, in the case of a relief event occurring, you need to do something with whatever is released by that relief event. So there's a flow chart here that is very, very useful to guide you through this process. The first question you have to ask is, is the stream gas only? If not, and the stream contains liquid, then ask yourself, does the stream contain gas? If it does, you've got to separate that gas out of the liquid, and we'll cover what we do with that in a minute. But if it doesn't contain gas, then for liquids, contain them, treat them later. So there'll be some sort of containment where that is a problem for after the relief event has finished. So if we've got gas in our relief stream, then we make sure that the relief stream contains only gas. And then we ask ourselves the question, is the gas either toxic or flammable? And if not, the answer is an easy one, disperse to atmosphere through a relief valve or through a bursting disc. And we'll see pictures of relief valves that do this in a second. On the assumption that the, toxic, the gas is either toxic or flammable, the next question to ask is, is the gas toxic? If not, and you're dealing just with a flammable gas, then you have to consider whether it's possible to quickly dilute that flammable gas below the lower explosive limit. If so, what you can do is you can disperse it through a relief valve. This might, might sound somewhat surprising, but you'll find a lot of relief valves on refinery operations vent straight to atmosphere, but do so in such a way that lots of air is sucked into a turbulent plume, which ensures that the lower explosive limit is never reached and that whatever is relieved cannot be set fire to. Now, if the gas is toxic, you need to consider whether or not this gas is treatable. If no, and you can't treat it into a non-toxic state, then treat it in a scrubbing system. For example, you might have some absorbers or emergency scrubbers that will neutralize that toxicity. And then you've got a, a safe gas stream to deal with after those emergency scrubbers. If you can dilute to non-toxic, you follow a similar route for the considerations of a flammable gas, and you go down the dispersion route. If you can entrain enough air in a turbulent plume to safely get that um, venting below any toxicity concern, then just a plain relief device may be the way to do it. Now, if you're venting material, sometimes it's very useful to have various pieces of emergency gas liquid separation. And I'm going to show you two. The first thing is the blowdown drum. What we have here on the whiteboard is a relief stream entering the vessel in red, and it's entering below a liquid level. And that liquid is water. So what you've got is hot gases that contain condensable hydrocarbons, for example, and maybe non-condensable hydrocarbons, maybe nitrogens in the system as well. And so what you want to do is to get the condensable hydrocarbons into the liquid phase and then deal with the non-condensable gases, the, hydrocar the nitrogen, say, maybe carbon monoxide or something unpleasant like that, then with a scrubbing or flaring system. And so what you have is a sufficient volume of water cascading into this drum to douse those gases. And that can either be cooling water or in an emergency, it might also be fire water. 
Then your gases can be sent for further treatment or flaring, or if there's no toxicity or flammability concerns to vent, and the liquids are then sent to further treatment and containment. One of the vessels that might come in useful for that further treatment for a two-phase mixture is a disengagement drum, such as that as I've got on the whiteboard. If you have aqueous phase and organic phase materials, you've probably got a liquid-liquid equilibrium set up. You're probably going to have two immiscible phases resulting from that. And it's usual then to have one of these disengagement drums such that you can decant off your organic phase and send it for either treatment or recovery and do the same with your aqueous phase. But the treatment and recovery systems there are going to be different. It's also usual, again, to provide a means of getting rid of excess vapours, which you can either vent or flare. So let's think about atmospheric venting. Now, there are various pieces of established um, guidance in this area. Now, the American Petroleum Institute RP521 is one of those established pieces of guidance. And this states that atmospheric venting can be used if a gas is flammable and non-toxic. If a gas is flammable, and that you can entrain enough air into it quickly enough to reduce the mixture below the low explosive limit. And again, with toxic systems, if you can quickly disperse the gas below any toxic concentration limits. But at all times, environmental legislation has to be adhered to. So it may not be possible in the toxic case to sufficiently disperse, in which case you're going into scrubbing and treatment systems. So if you look at refineries, you'll often see very large distillation columns, such as these that I've pictured. And if you look at the top of these distillation columns, you will see little nozzles pointing upwards, as I've highlighted in that white box on the right-hand photograph. These little nozzles up close are probably about this diameter, maybe bigger, and are attached to relief valves. Now, the service in these distillation columns typically is very flammable. But however, these relief devices have been designed such that should a relief valve lift, then you get a effectively a supersonic plume coming out of these relief valves so you can entrain lots and lots of air in very very quickly and then what that does is to dilute your relief stream below the lower explosive limit and so you can safely vent the atmosphere as opposed to routing through sometimes a very very costly flaring system. Now if you can't dispose safely of a flammable or toxic or flammable and toxic gas through a um, relief valve, then you have to treat it somehow. So what you're going to be then doing is discharging your relief device into a set of pipework. Now it's essential that this pipework doesn't put an upper limit on your relief system. So what we need to do is to design a relief header and we need to make sure that it adheres to the following criteria. The design is based on the relief flow that gives the highest pressure drop. So that might be a fire relief scenario, for example, from one or two or more vessels. For conventional relief valves, the relief header pressure drop should be limited to 10% of the set pressure of that valve. The relief header should never achieve conditions that restrict its capacity. So, for example, if you think back to your compressible flow, you know that even in a constant diameter piece of piping, a compressible gas will form a boundary layer that eventually, eventually will end up choking it under certain conditions. So that cannot happen in a relief header. When you're designing your relief header as well, think about pressure segregation. If you have a vessel at high pressure relieving, and that relief header also connects to vessels at low pressure, and they might be relieving, what happens if that high pressure gas backflows into one of these vessels at a lower pressure. That's what can cause the types of failure that we saw in the last part of this lecture. So for goodness sake, segregate the pressures of the various systems for your relief header. Now, calculations to the relief header can be done under the assumption of either isothermal or adiabatic compressible flow, and the actual flow regime will probably be bracketed by those two. So a typical workflow for the design of a relief header could look a little bit like this. You start at the system outlet. At the system outlet, you either know the outlet pressure, because you know what you're discharging to, or maybe the outlet Mach number, because you know you need some sort of entrainment condition. So using the formula here on the board, what you can then do is calculate one, either the Mach number or the pressure that you don't know. If you know the Mach number, you can calculate the pressure and vice versa. 
Then what you do is you work backwards through each pipe section of constant diameter to calculate the inlet pressure given by the formula that I've put there on the board for you. For isothermal flow, that formula will give you P1. Now I've put there a list of nomenclature so you can use these formulas and what you do is you keep working backwards through your relief header design until you get to a relief valve. Then what you do is you check that the back pressure at the relief valve is low enough to prevent choking. So is that back pressure low enough to allow the worst case flow scenario? And under the conditions of the worst case flow scenario, has any part of your relief header choked? If yes, you need to redesign it. So relief header design is complex and we're not going to talk any more about that, but hopefully that's given you at least an initial picture of one of the calculation methods that can be used to design them. So your relief header's got to go somewhere. For a toxic system, it might go to an emergency scrubber of some sort. For a flammable system, it will go to a flare. So typically, you're going to have liquid disengagement before a flare, just in case there's any entrained liquid in that relief stream. And this is an example of a knockout drum. It could be similar to the blow drum, down drum that we looked at a few slides back, with or without the the header for um, provide provision of condensing non condensable of con condensing condensable gases. Now flares come in all sorts of different types. They can either be at ground level, sometimes you find things called burn pits. They can be shielded, or they can be elevated unshielded flares. Elevated unshielded flares are arguably the most visible and probably the least popular with local residents. And elevated flares can sometimes have steam injection to assist their burning, otherwise they can burn very, very noisily or very, very smokily. So let's recap a few key points. If a relief situation occurs, four options are available for the relief stream. Containment, treatment, dispersal or flaring. Multi-phase relief streams require vapour disengagement with blowdown or disengagement drums. Design of multi-phase relief headers is way beyond the scope of this course and is a very specialist subject. The design of vapour phase relief headers needs to avoid choking, so knowledge of compressible flow is absolutely essential. I've given you a methodology to start to think about how that might be done. So finally, and just to provide a bit of a light-hearted relief at the end of this lecture, if you'll excuse the pun, here's well, two well-known uh, comic characters exploring pressure relief firsthand and all of the perils that it contains. So I hope you enjoy that.